This is Pam Walls from Community Legal Services, and I'm here with Amy Hirsch, also from Community Legal Services. Hi. Um, and so we're going to be uh, talking today about the Medicare savings uh, programs and MOD benefits in Pennsylvania. Um, so the agenda for today is first, I'll be talking about the Medicare savings programs. I'll talk about eligibility for those programs and also the benefits that people can receive through them. And then Amy will talk about the MOD program. And again, she'll talk about both eligibility and benefits. And then at the end, we're going to spend a little time talking about advising clients about whether they can get both programs. Um, and if not, what factors to think about if they have to choose between the Medicare Savings Program and MOD. All right. So we're going to start by talking about the Medicare Savings Program. They are also known as the buy-in program because the welfare department is buying people into Medicare, or MSP for short. The Medicare Savings Programs are a Medicaid benefit which pays cost sharing for low-income Medicare beneficiaries. This is really important because Medicare beneficiaries have to pay um, a lot of cost sharing. They have to pay monthly premiums in order to receive um, Medicare Part B. Those premiums are taken out of their checks before they receive them. They also have to pay um, a deductible of $1,408 if they're hospitalized and an annual deductible for Part B outpatient care of $198. And then Medicare only pays 80%. And so the Medicare beneficiary has to pay an additional 20% of their care. This means that with people who only have Medicare can end up with big out-of-pocket expenses. So the Medicare Savings Program is really important to help people get those expenses paid for. So to qualify for the Medicare for the MSP, a person must first be eligible for Medicare Part A, even if they're not currently enrolled, and they have to meet income and resource limits. There are three different levels of assistance, uh, which are called QIMBY, SLIMBY, and QI, and each of these levels has different income limits and slightly di and, and different benefits. So first, let's talk about the QIMBY program. That stands for Qualified Medicare Beneficiary. Um, this is uh, the most generous of the programs, and it's also for the lowest income population. The income limit for QIMBY is 100% of, of the federal poverty guidelines. So that's for a single person, it's 1,064 a month, for a married couple, 1,437. And in determining income eligibility for these programs, both spouses' incomes count. In determining income eligibility, also it's important to know that the SSI income counting rules apply, and they apply to all three of these MSP categories we'll be talking about. So this means that in determining countable income, there's a $20 unearned income disregard. And if the person has earned income, you can disregard an additional $65 plus one half of remaining earnings. The resource limit for, um, for, the, for the Quimby program is higher than, than most standard um, Medicaid resource limits. It's $7,860 for a single person and $11,800 for a couple. So what are the benefits that people can get in the Quimby program? So first of all, it will pay the Medicare Part B premium for people. That's $144.60 a month for most people in 2020. Um, and so the result of getting into the Quimby program is that that money is not taken out of the person's Social Security check. That's really important because for a person, say, with a monthly income of $1,000 a month, this is going to save them from having to pay almost 15% of their income each month. The Quimby program also pays for the rest of the person's Medicare cost sharing, including their Medicare deductibles, like the hospital deductible and the Part B deductible I was talking about before, and other cost sharing. So it'll pay the rest of the, the 20%. Um, for people who are not entitled to premium free Part A, it also pays the Part A premium. Most people who get Social Security retirement or, or Social Security disability receive Medicare Part A without having to pay a premium. Um, but some people who haven't been able to work enough to be fully insured for Medicare purposes, including many people who are on SSI, aren't entitled to Medicare Part A free of charge. The Quimby program pays that premium for them so that they can be enrolled in Medicare Part A and be recorded. Uh, 
so um, if and another thing to know is in Pennsylvania, the income limit for Quimby is the same as for Healthy Horizons. It's 100% of the federal poverty limit. So many, most people who get Quimby are also going to get Healthy Horizons. If the person <coughs> has resources under the Healthy Horizons limit, which is $2,000 for a single person, $3,000 for a couple, they also get full Medicaid um, in the Healthy Horizons category. And they're called a Quimby Plus. These folks get all of their Medicare cost sharing paid, and they also get full Medicaid. So on the other hand, if a person uh, is income eligible for Quimby, but has resources over the Healthy Horizons limit, but under the Quimby resource limit, that individual is a Quimby only. They get an access card, which will pay for Medicare deductibles and cost sharing, but that's all it pays for. It won't pay for full Medicaid benefits. This is a pretty unusual situation because most people, um, we're talking here about people whose income is at 100% of poverty or lower, so it's pretty unusual that they would have resources over the Healthy Horizons limit. I have actually only seen one of these people who's just a Quimby in all the time I've been doing this. Um, so um, it's an unusual situation. The next category is the Swimby, the specified low income, and I left out the word Medicare, the specified low income Medicare beneficiary. This serves people at a slightly higher income level. The income limit for a Swimby is 120% of the poverty level. So for a single person, um, they would be eligible if their income was just over the Quimby limit um, at $1,065 up to $1,276 a month. And for a married couple, Swimbies um, are people whose incomes are between $1,438 up to $1,724 a month. Again, the SSI um, income counting rules apply, so there's a $20 unearned income disregard and the SSI earned income disregard apply. The resource limit is the same for, for all three types of Medic um, MSP, so it's, again, it's the $78,60 and $11,800 um, resource limit. Swimby um, benefits uh, are, are somewhat less generous than Quimby. It pays just the Part B premium. That's still significant. That's $144 a month in the person's pocket. However, Slimby only pays the Part B premium. It doesn't pay for the rest of the Medicare cost sharing. It doesn't pay for deductibles um, and other cost sharing. Um, so, however, some Slimbies also have full Medicaid. These would be, um, they would be in the categories of Medicaid for people with income over 100% of poverty. So, um, so that would really be MAUD or waiver. And if so, that person's going to have Medicaid coverage as well, which will pick up their cost share. The third and final category is the QI, which stands for Qualified Individual. The income limit for that, this for the QI program, is 135% of poverty. And so the, um, the income ranges are $1,277, just over the Slendy limit, up to $1,436 for a single person, and $1,725 to $1,940 for a married couple. And again, um, the $20 unearned disregard and the SSI, and here's a typo, sorry, the SSI earned income disregard apply. Same resource limit, this higher resource limit. The benefits paid for QI um, participants, again, like Slimby, it pays for the Part B premium only. It doesn't pay for the rest of the Medicare cost sharing. Um, an important difference about QI is that in order to qualify for QI, the individual cannot also be receiving full Medicaid. Um, so that means that you can't be both a QI and on waiver or MOD. And this means that applicants may face a choice between whether they want to receive the MSP on the one hand or waiver or MOD on the other. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will talk a little bit about the factors to consider if someone has to make this choice. I want to talk a little bit about the resource counting rules because they're slightly more generous than other um, Medicaid resource rules. Certain assets are excluded, the primary residence and the property surrounding it, one car, burial plots, also irrevocable burial reserves or prepaid funerals. And then there are some rules about life insurance. For life insurance, um, you look at first the total face value of all policies. The face value is the amount that the policy would pay if the person died. 
you add up the face value of all policies, if the total of all the face value is under, of all the policies is under 1,500, they don't, it doesn't count. If the face value of all the policies adds up to more than $1,500, um, you next look at the cash surrender value of any of the, po um, the policies. Some, some, ca um, some life insurance policies accumulate cash value and, um, uh, and can be turned in um, for, for cash. And if so, the state looks at the cash surrender value and counts the amount over $1,000 toward um, resource eligibility. So they'll, in other words, they'll disregard $1,000 worth of cash surrender value. A nice feature um, of the MSP programs is that people can get three months retroactive coverage. Uh, this, uh, the people who can get this are um, the Quimby Plus group, people who have both Quimby and Healthy Horizons, people in Slimby and QI. They can get retroactive eligibility for three months prior to the month of application. This means that they'll get a refund for the Part B premiums they paid in the three months prior to the month of application. An exception to this is that there's no retroactive coverage for people who are Quimby only. Again, this is a really rare group of people who are income eligible for Quimby, um, but not resource eligible for Healthy Horizons. Um, so the Welfare Department is required to review each application um, to determine whether the person qualifies for retroactive coverage. And um, assuming the person does, <clears throat> the applicant will get a refund for the, the premium, the Part B premiums they paid in the three months prior to the month of application. They'll get this by the same method that they receive their Social Security or SSI benefits. So if the person's getting their, their benefits um, direct deposit in the bank, they will see a refund pop up there in the amount of about $433 several weeks to a month after they um, are approved for MSP. You want to tell your clients to watch for that refund. And if it's not received, you'll want to advocate for, with the county assistance office to make sure that, it, that the refund's been properly processed and that it gets paid. So how to apply for the MSP. So first of all, Everybody who's applying for Medicaid is required to be screened for MSP by the Welfare Department and enrolled if they're eligible. So people applying for Medicaid should be enrolled in the MSP if they're eligible for it. Other ways to apply for the MSP um, include um, an application. There's, there's an application called the PA600M, which is a, the application that is specifically um, to apply for the MSP. And you can find it on the Welfare Department's website at the, at the URL that um, I provided in the, in the links. Uh, the person can uh, complete it and return it to the County Assistance Office to have their eligibility for MSP um, uh, determined. Also, people can apply online on Compass. And then finally, SSI recipients automatically get enrolled into both Medicare and the MSP in the month that they become eligible for Medicare. So this is a good thing to know. Um, some S many SSI recipients aren't automatically eligible or are not otherwise eligible for Medicare because they may not have enough of a work history to have paid enough quarters of Medicare um, tax. However, as SSI recipients, the state will, will buy them into Medicare by enrolling them in the MSP. And this will happen in the month that they become eligible for Medicare. They will be enrolled in Medicare, and their Part B premiums and their Part A premiums will be paid for by the state. In addition to paying all this cost sharing, there are a few other really important benefits that being in the MSP gets for people. First of all, People who are enrolled in the MSP automatically also get enrolled in the full low-income subsidy, otherwise known as extra help. This is the program that pays um, cost sharing for low-income Medicare um, beneficiaries for their prescription drug coverage. So getting enrolled in this will also substantially reduce the amount that they have to pay in co-pays for their prescription drugs. Um, another benefit is for people who are subject to a late enrollment penalty for, for Part D. So if people do not enroll in Medicare Part D when they first become eligible, and but then they later enroll, they have to pay a late enrollment penalty. 
Um, and the penalty is that their monthly premium goes up by 10 percent for each full year that they delay enrolling in Medicare Part B. So that means that people end up paying higher Part B premiums. However, if the person enrolls in the MSP, um, they, they won't have to pay their Part B premiums and they won't have to pay the penalties either. So it's a nice way of dealing with a late enrollment penalty for someone who's eligible for the MSP. Uh, in addition, if people don't enroll in Medicare when they're first eligible, they have to wait for a particular time of year to enroll in Medicare. They have to enroll during the, in general, they have to enroll during the general enrollment period, which runs from January 1st to March 31st, and then their enrollment in Medicare takes effect in the following July. However, if you enroll in the MSP, the state can, can buy the person into Medicare right away and at any time of the year. So it's a benefit that people can get into Medicare right away without having to wait for the general enrollment period. Um, finally, MSP comes with a protection against balanced billing. Uh, medical providers are prohibited from billing Quimby's for cost sharing, even if the provider only accepts Medicare and is not a Medicaid provider. So for Quimby's, Medicare is the primary payer, it'll pay first. The Quimby program would pay the cost sharing, but even if the provider is not enrolled in Medicaid and therefore is not going to get paid for by the Quimby program, they are prohibited by law from billing the Quimby for that for that those additional costs. So a few words about fixing problems that come up with MSP. We used to see a lot of problems with people getting enrolled in the MSP. Um, largely because the enrollment process involves the welfare department communicating electronically with both Social Security and CMS, which runs Medicare. They have to exchange data in order to, to do this enrollment and to process refunds. And um, things used to go wrong. That has been fixed. Um, and now runs generally pretty smoothly. Um, but if you do run into, if you do have a client who's having problems, um, a few different resources. The Medical Assistance Handbook, Chapter 388, describes both eligibility and the enrollment procedures, which might help if someone's having a problem to understand what the procedures are that the county is using. And then if you have a case that the, that the county assistance office has not been able to resolve, the Welfare Department has an electronic mailbox for buy-in issues, um, which you can email and send information asking for help, and they can often resolve enrollment problems and that that um, email address is rabuyin at pa.gov. That's a really good resource for problems where a, a caseworker or supervisor is trying to fix something but just isn't able to. And then finally, the Center for Medicare Advocacy, which is a nonprofit um, uh, backup center in Washington, D.C. that specializes in Medicare issues, they are a re another really good resource um, for complicated issues. Um, including um, uh, Part A buy-in enrollment for people who are 65 or older, but who aren't entitled to med free Medicare Part A or for SSI, which would buy them in. This is a, um, a problem that can be um, a little bit complicated, does not come up too often, so I didn't want to go into a lot of details here about it, but if you do see a problem like that, feel free to reach out to, to me or Amy and we can provide you with information about it. And the Center for Medicare Advocacy also has great information about dealing with that, that, that situation. Thanks, I'm gonna turn it over now to Amy. And Amy, while you're getting set up, this is Kelly. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first of the CLE polls. Um, attorneys who are requesting a CLE substantive credit for this webinar, Please respond to the poll on your screen now. This poll will be up for two minutes. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, Amy. Yeah, okay. sorry, we're just having a little technical issue with advancing the PowerPoint for some reason. Huh. Uh, my keyboard has stopped working. Oh. Um, in fact, it appears to be disconnected. Oh. Um, sorry, Pam is, is calling 
<laughs> under my desk. More information than on the webinar probably not. This um, slide did just advance. Okay. Well, that's a start, and hopefully <laughs> it will get tired. So, medical assistance for workers with disabilities is known as MAUD. Um, and if you're looking for additional information about it, if you Google, the easiest way to Google is using the initials and the AWG. Um, the purpose of MAUD is to encourage people to work despite having a disability. So often when people think about disabilities, they assume that someone with a disability is unable to work, but many people with disabilities can work and uh, people may be able to do a little bit of work even if they can't work full time. The MOD program has much higher income and resource limits um, than other Medicaid categories. Unlike most Medicaid categories, it requires a small monthly premium. So it's not free. People are gonna have to pay for it. And, and part of what we'll talk about is um, thinking through when it makes sense for people. Um, for most people, it makes sense as long as the medical expenses that they have that they would otherwise have to pay out of pocket are more than the amount of the premium. And we'll talk about the premium amounts. But for most people that we see, those premium amounts are in the range of um, 50 to $60 a month. One of the great things about MOD is that it provides full Medicaid benefits. Um, the welfare department's information about MOD is contained in the medical assistance handbook, which is available on the DHS website and it's chapter 316. So who's eligible for MOD? People who are aged 16 to 64. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but one of the ironies is that for people who've been getting MAUD, when they reach age 65, they lose MAUD and their medical expenses usually go way up. So um, that is a really sad event at that point. Um, in order to get MAUD, the individual must be employed and they must be getting paid for work that they're doing. However, there are no minimum hour requirements and no minimum dollar amount of earnings. That work can be very informal work. They must be found disabled either by SSA or under the SSA rules by the Department of Human Services Medical Review Team. They have to have income after deductions, and we'll talk more about that, below 250% of federal poverty. So again, much higher than most uh, Medicaid categories. And they have to have countable resources of $10,000 or less. And again, this is a much higher resource limit than for most categories. So um, what that translates into uh, for the income limit is $2,659 a month for one person or $3,592 a month for two people. You use the SSI income rules. So first there's a $20 deduction from any income unearned uh, or earned. Um, then for the MOD program, you get to deduct any impairment related work expenses. So if the individual needs special equipment or special transportation, um, any expense that they would have that's related to their impairment that would permit them to work, they can deduct those expenses. And then you deduct $65 and then one half of the remaining earned income. The resource limit is uh, the same uh, list of countable resources that Pam discussed. And for MAUD, the, there's one resource limit regardless of the family size. So it's a $10,000 resource limit, whether it's a single individual or a married couple or uh, whether the individual has children. And unlike other Medicaid categories, 
there's a resource limit even if the individual does have kids, um, unfortunately. But again, it's $10,000. Most of our clients at least have substantially under that. So I wanna work through um, a couple of income examples. So the first one is Jane, she's 45, she's single. She has no income other than her earnings. Um, she, is she eligible for MAUD? Um, 4,500 a month, that seems like a lot in this context. Um, but yes, she is eligible. And the PowerPoint runs through the math. You first subtract the $20, then you subtract 65, then you divide the remainder in half. What you get for her as countable income is $2,207 a month. And if you compare that to the MAUD income limit for a single person, which is 2,659, she is clearly under it, she's MAUD eligible. Our second example is John, he's 58. He gets 1,600 a month in social security disability, and he earns $30 a month. His wife earns 3,800 a month. Is he eligible? Um, people who are married, the spouse's income counts, and you look at them as a family of two. So um, you have to include both John's income and his wife's income. So the first thing we do is look at John's income, and we see, oh, he can get the $20 disregard because that's applied to any source of income, whether it's earned or unearned. So he has $1,580 a month of countable income. Um, his $30 of earnings is completely disregarded because it's less than the $65 that would be the first deduction from earned income. For the wife's income, you only get that $20 for the household. So you only, that $20 has already been used up as a deduction. But you get to take the earned income deductions from the wife's income. So first you subtract the $65, then you divide the remainder in half. And um, it turns out that the wife's countable income is 1,867. You add that to John's countable income of 1,580 and their joint countable income is 3,447. And again, if you compare that to the limit for a two-person household, which is 3,592, they are below the limit he is eligible. So the next financial question is, and, and I should say for these examples, I've assumed less than $10,000 in resources. So the next question is, how much would they have to pay for the premium? So the income of a spouse is counted in determining eligibility, but it is not counted in determining the amount of the premium, which is very nice. So uh, for John's example, the only income that's counted in determining the premium is his own income, and his own countable income is 1,580. The premium amount is 5% currently of the countable income, which would get you a monthly premium of $79 for John. Um, in Jane's example, because her earnings are substantially higher and her uh, all of her income is her own, not her spouse's, um, her countable income is 2,207, you multiply it by 0.05, you get a premium amount of $110 a month. Both of those premiums are higher than we usually see people pay. Um, most of our clients have less income than Jane or John and his wife. Um, and most premiums we see are between 50 and $60 a month. So what kind of employment counts? As I said, employment can be formal or informal. 
The proof can be pay stubs if it's formal employment or a letter from the employer if it's informal employment. No minimum number of hours uh, of work and no minimum amount of pay is required. Um, we have often gotten mod for people who do things like walk a neighbor's dog, tutor a friend's child, drive someone on errands. I had a client who was helping a friend do laundry by folding her sweaters. Um, I had another client who was taking out the trash uh, for a neighbor. Um, people can be creative about what the work consists of. They will need a letter um, from the employer. And we've given you a sample letter. It can be really short and sweet. I employ Jane Doe to work for me as a dog walker. She works one hour a week. I pay her $7.25 an hour. If you have questions, here's my phone number. It of course needs to have the address of the individual who's the employer and their signature. Um, while there's no requirement that the individual be paid minimum wage, we, we tend to suggest it. Um, I feel a little uncomfortable to suggesting to anyone that they work even informally for less than minimum wage. Um, so whenever a person has a disability and is over the income or resource limits for Healthy Horizons, you should think about MOD. Um, keep in mind that if someone can get Healthy Horizons, of course, that's preferable. There's no premium. And the benefits that you get are the same. Um, if the person has been determined to be disabled, um, for example, if they're getting social security benefits and SSA has determined them disabled, but they're not employed, you want to ask them, can, could they do a bit of informal work on a part-time basis? And is there anyone they can talk to to arrange that? Um, if they're getting social, social security disability, a small amount of work will not interfere with their social security benefits. It'll be way below substantial gainful activity. It, it won't create an issue for them. But um, one note of caution. If the person is getting workers' comp or long-term disability, or is trying to get workers' comp or long-term disability, you have to be really, really careful. You want to be sure and check with their workers' comp attorney or their disability attorney to be sure that the work will not prevent them from getting benefits. Um, I should say at different points, we've been told different things by different workers' comp attorneys when we consulted them uh, about clients. Um, but my understanding is that any work that an individual is doing could prevent the person from being found fully disabled for workers' comp purposes. Um, and it could potentially affect eligibility for long-term disability insurance. So you wanna be sure that by assisting someone to get MAUD, you're not creating a bigger problem for them um, with their workers' comp or if they're getting uh, long-term disability insurance. So um, conversely, you wanna consider MAUD whenever a person is employed and is over the income limit for other types of MA, including MAGI. So you want to ask in that situation, does the person have a medical problem or do they need health-sustaining medication? And you would need to prove disability for them. And in the MOD context, that's really relatively straightforward and easy. So um, if, if the person is getting social security disability, um, they're considered disabled for MOD purposes. Um, or if they had been getting SSI but lost SSI because they have income that puts them over the SSI limit, um, they could be considered disabled for MOD purposes. If they don't, if, if Social Security has not determined them disabled, they will need to prove disability. And if they're financially eligible for MOD, and there's any information provided to the county assistance office that shows disability, they can be found presumptively eligible for MOD. So the presumptive eligibility, proving disability for that, um, 
can be done in a number of different ways. The first is by submitting an employability assessment form, the PA 1663, showing disability expected to last 12 months or longer. That's the same form you would generally use to get somebody Healthy Horizons. In addition, though, for MOD, the Health Sustaining Medications form, which we don't think a lot about in other contexts, um, is sufficient to get the person presumptive eligibility for MOD. Or if there's oral or written information from a medical provider, or caregiver, or an agency serving the individual, that's sufficient for presumptive eligibility for MOD. I generally discourage people from relying on oral information because the Welfare Department, DHS, has enough difficulty tracking paper that people submit, I really am um, worried about whether or not oral information gets acted on. Um, but in a crunch, you could provide oral information and follow it up in writing. Um, that uh, information could be, um, for example, a letter from uh, a physician or other medical care provider. It could be a phone call or a note from uh, a caregiver that explains the disability, or from an agency like uh, OVR if the person's working with um, book rehab, or uh, if they're working with one of the agencies that provides assistance to people with developmental disabilities or other disabilities. Um, once presumptive eligibility for MOD is authorized, the County Assistance Office will request proof of the disability in order to make a medical review team referral. And um, the medical review team is a, a team that works for the Department of Human Services. They review the medical records of people who apply for MOD um, and make a decision about whether they view them as uh, disabled for this purpose. Um, they may request more detailed medical records. You should not be surprised if your client gets a notice asking for records from their doctor's office, and the medical review team will also contact the doctor's office directly. Um, they tend to make favorable decisions. Uh, we have very rarely seen a situation where the MRT has rejected someone for MOD. Um, where there's uh, either a 12-month employability assessment form or um, medical records to substantiate um, whatever the other uh, allegations about disability are. The initial presumptive eligibility period is three months. It can be extended for another three months if the MRT needs more information. Um, and I personally have very rarely seen individuals who lost MOD uh, because of issues around the MRT. Um, and Pam beside me is not. <laughs> um, so our experience at least is that this does not tend to be a big problem. Um, you can also get retroactive coverage through MOD for the three months prior to the month of application. And that can be approved as part of presumptive eligibility as long as the CAO has some type of information about disability and you've established that the person was financially eligible during the retroactive month. The person will need to pay the MOD premium for the retroactive months before the county assistance office can authorize the retro period. And for that, you want to think about how much those bills were because the person's going to have to pay that premium. So if someone applied in April, they submitted their information about income and resources and disability, and they have medical bills for January, February, and March, the County Assistance Office can give them retro mod um, as well as ongoing mod. So they don't have to pay the premium in advance for the ongoing coverage. 
So the county assistance office, in, in our situation, the county assistance office can authorize ongoing presumptive mod starting April 1st. The person will get a bill in the mail for the premium for the month of April and for subsequent months. And they need to pay those premiums, but they don't need to have paid them before the coverage is authorized. But for the retro months, they will have to pay the premium before the months are authorized. So you would want to look at how much are those medical bills. If the medical bill for January is for $30 and the premium would be $65, you don't want to sign up for January. But if the medical bill for February involved a hospitalization and it's a lot of money, you want to sign up for February. You can pick and choose which of the retro months you want covered. And you could theoretically be eligible only for some of the retro months, not all. And they look at them each month separately. In addition, when you apply for MAUD, um, the, if, if you use the special MAUD application, it explicitly asks you whether you want your coverage to begin in the month of application or in the following month. And the reason for that is you're going to have to pay the premium for that month. And let's say you're applying on April 28th and you don't have a lot of bills from April. There's no reason to pay the premium for April. You're not going to get anything out of that. So in that situation, you would check the box to say that you want your coverage to start in the following month and therefore your premium starts in the following month. And I should have mentioned, you can apply for MUD online through Compass. You can um, use the general Medicaid application form, you know, the, the general PA 600. Um, but that asks a lot more questions and it doesn't ask exactly the targeted questions. So um, if you're not applying online for MUD, I um, recommend using the special MUD application. If you Google MOD application, it'll come right PA, it'll come right up. Um, and it's also in the materials for this webinar. Um, so if you haven't already received it, Kelly will be sending those out. There's one other group that can get MOD as well, and that's workers with a medically improved disability. They have to meet the age, income, and resource requirements for MOD. They have a minimum um, requirement about earnings and work hours. They have to work at least 40 hours a month. They have to earn at least minimum wage for that work. They have to have a medically improved disability that no longer meets the Social Security disability test and still have a severe impairment. So for example, I had a client who had received Social Security disability. He had um, end-stage kidney disease. He then had a kidney transplant and it was great. He was able to go back to work. He was no longer eligible for SSDI, um, but he needed anti-rejection meds. And he got coverage through medical assistance for workers with disabilities as a worker with a medically improved disability. Um, the uh, DHS uh, Medicaid handbook and the MOD chapter gives other examples, including an individual with AIDS or HIV, or an individual with epilepsy whose condition has improved, but who still needs medical monitoring and care. So um, just to recap, MOD is especially good for people who are getting SSDI and are in the waiting period for Medicare. For people who have Medicare, uh, who are not eligible for Healthy Horizons, um, but who can use MAUD to pay for costs not covered by Medicare. For people who are employed or who have spouses with higher earnings that would make them ineligible for Healthy Horizons. For people with savings above the Healthy Horizons limit, but below the MAUD limit. So between $2,000 if it's one person or $3,000 if it's two people, 
and the MAUD limit of 10,000. So who can't get MAUD? People who are 65 or older, as I said before, very sadly, medical costs go way up for people who lose MAUD when they reach age 65. Um, people who are getting QI, Medicare buy-in, as Pam discussed, you can get either MAUD or QI, but not both. And people who are five-year barred, unless they have an emergency medical condition, like other federal Medicaid categories. Um, but I do want to note that you can get MAUD um, EMA. So if you've got someone with an emergency medical condition who's five-year barred or who's undocumented for whom you can establish EMA eligibility, they could get MAUD through EMA. Um, the interaction of MAUD and Medicare, as we've said, people can get MAUD while they're getting Medicare or while they're waiting for Medicare. They can get MAUD and they can get Quimby or Slimby buy-in, um, but they can't uh, get QA, QI and MAUD. And keep in mind that getting MAUD automatically qualifies you for low-income subsidy, also known as extra help, for Medicare Part D premiums and copays. So how to choose between MAUD and QI? Turning it over to Pam. Okay. Kelly, do you, do you need this uh, chance to check in with people? Sure, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to launch the second of the CLE credit polls for attorneys that are on the webinar. Please respond with an answer to the question. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Um, great. Okay, so we've been talking about the fact that um, you can't get both QI and full Medicaid. Um, and the issue could be MAUD, which is really what we're talking about mostly now, or it could be one of the waiver programs. And so um, we want to talk a little bit about how to choose between them. Um, so basically, you want to help the client figure out which, which choice would make them financially better off. So on the one hand, you want to think about how much would the MAUD premium be? Because they're going to have to pay that in order to get the coverage. Um, on the other hand, how much is um, how much is the Medicare Part D premium going to be? You want to think about what they're going to save if they if they get the QI program. They're going to the benefit will be that they will get the Part D premium, which is probably $144. Sometimes it varies somewhat. Um, and you also want to think about what other cost sharing. Um, um, might the person get covered with MAUD um, if they had full Medicaid? And so you want to talk to the person about how much, um, um, what kind of health care that they get to try to figure out, are they likely to have to pay large deductibles or co-pays? Um, because if so, um, they might may want to opt for MAUD, which will cover that cost sharing. Um, so, for instance, you, you want to get a feel for um, what kind of health conditions does the person have? Are they likely, are they someone who um, are likely to be hospitalized? Um, do they have a lot of specialists they see? Do they need a complicated course of treatment that's going to involve going to a lot of providers? Um, if so, that may point in the direction of wanting to get MAUD to get that complete coverage. On the other hand, if they're pretty healthy and mainly just see a primary care physician, um, their Medicare cost sharing may not um, uh, be, be as much. And they may want instead to, have, to reliably get the $144 paid each month with Medicare, um, with, the, with the QI program. Um, another thing to think about as you're thinking about whether the person um, uh, should, really, should go for MAUD is whether the person's Medicare cost sharing could it get addressed by their joining a Medicare Advantage plan. So a Medicare Advantage plan is a managed care plan offered by a private insurance company that provides the person's Medicare. Um, and each plan is slightly different in terms of what it covers. They have to cover actuarially at least as much as Medicare, um, traditional Medicare would cover, but they can also, they can structure it slightly differently and they can offer additional coverage. They can fill in some of the gaps that um, 
are present in Medicare. And so uh, someone may be able to find a Medicare Advantage plan that um, doesn't make them pay 20%, for instance, instead just has them pay a flat fee every time they go to a specialist. And they, and they may not have a, you know, um, um, and they may even be able to find a Medicare Advantage plan that reduces the, the hospital deductibles. So that's another thing to factor in. In looking for Medicare Advantage plans, the APPRISE program is a really helpful resource. That's the state health insurance um, counseling program. Um, you can Google APPRISE, A-P-P-R-I-S-E, to find the APPRISE plan, in, um, the APPRISE program in your area. And they uh, are counselors who will help Medicare beneficiaries um, research and think through um, what plans might be good for them. So we're going to do a couple of, uh, just talk briefly about a couple of examples for trying to choose. And my, it's when we switch. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Somehow Pam and my switching who's closer to the uh, phone so you can hear us appears to incapacitate my um, keyboard. So the last slide that uh, you're not currently able to see um, gives an example of the decision making about whether to go with MAUD or QI. And so I'm just going to read that. Um, and hopefully when you're able to download the PowerPoint, you'll have a copy of it in writing. Um, so the, the example is Joe. He's got a MAUD premium of $60 a month. Um, the Medicare Part B premium would be $144. If he doesn't have a lot of other routine medical expenses, he'd be much better off with um, QI and reliably getting the 144, um, unless he's someone who worries about what if he develops an illness and needs to go into the hospital. Um, he could, however, at any point apply for MAUD, and he could apply for the three months retro of MAUD, so he could, um, maximize his financial situation by um, trying to stay calm about that worry and uh, going ahead and getting QI and applying for MAUD when and if he actually needs it. Um, on the other hand, if he has mental health needs, the Medicare copay is 50%, um, or if he sees several specialists, or as Pam mentioned, might need hospitalization, you know, and, and the Medicare deductible is $1,408, or um, I've seen some clients who were paying for Medigap plans, and so they were paying a premium in effect for coverage like MAUD, but not actually quite as good coverage. Um, then the individual may be better off with MAUD. And what you really have to do is list out the expenses um, and the premiums and compare. Um, so one other thing I wanted to mention is that we, in the materials is the CLS um, community education flyer about MAUD, and I gave it to you in Word so that you can adapt it if you want to. Um, you can add in your program contact information if you want, and at the bottom uh, it gives the phone number for the customer service center for the Philadelphia County Assistance Office rather than the statewide customer service center number. So if you're adapting it, you'll probably want to put in the statewide customer service center number. And I think that's what we have. Um, Kelly, are there any questions? We haven't gotten any so far. If you have any questions for Amy or Pam, um, at the bottom of your screen on the menu bar, it says chat. If you click on that, you can type in any questions you may have. Um, we haven't gotten any yet. If you do have a question, please type it in quickly now. And I'm not seeing anything come up. That's how good how good of presenters you guys are. <laughs> oh, here's 
something. I have a client who was given mod. He did not want the three months retro. Is how how get them to take that off? <laughs> um, how how do you get them to take that off? Um, so just reach out to the county assistance office and tell them that he doesn't want the three months retro, and he shouldn't have to pay those premiums um for the three months retro they should be able to remove it he should recognize that he can't submit any bills of course um for that time period okay and nothing else no other questions are coming in so we will go ahead and end our webinar for today thank you amy and pam for a wonderful presentation Thank you. And if people think of questions later, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Great. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.